Now we are going to talk about the photographic zenith tube of the Observatoire de Neuchâtel. We had the opportunity to make a material on historical study of this PZT preserved at the Musée International d'Horlogerie à La chaux de -Fonds. A PZT is an astronomical scientific instrument used to make zenith observation. The origin of PZT principles date back from the 17th century. PZTs were developed during the 20th century, essentially at the US Naval Observatory of Washington. From the mid 20th century, it used spreads to different observatories. At the end of the 40s, PZTs were considered as the future of the positional astronomy. This instrument is also seen as a new step in time determination. It supplies a more precise time than that given by existing scientific instruments as meridian circles, for example. However, after having aroused real enthusiasm, this instrument will be relatively quickly outdated. The aim of our paper is to situate PZT in the history of astronomical scientific instruments. We want to see its role in the development of practical astronomy on time determination. While Zenith's observations were undertaken as early as the 17th century, it was not until nearly three centuries later that PZTs became a more widely, widely used scientific instrument. This development is near to the one of meridian circles, whose precursor was the Danish astronomer Ole Romer at the end of the 17th century. Indeed, Meridian Circle also took more than a century to become widely used during the 19th and 20th centuries. <clears throat> Other instruments were developed during the 20th century, such as the Donjon Astrolabe, and photocells were added to meridian circles to determine the time. However, PZT are presented in 1946 as cutting edge scientific instrument for latitude and time determination by eliminating many instrumental errors on the personal equation, the human factor. An important improvement in precision with PZTs is obtained, but this improvement comes shortly before a paradigmatic break in time metrology with the generalized introduction of atomic time. This circumstance has reduced its lifespan. In time metrology, PZTs makes the junction between meridian circles on atomic time at a period of accelerating technical development. In order to introduce this instrument, we will present the richly documented case of the PZT de l'Observatoire de Neuchâtel. We will first have a look on the history of the methods of Zenith's observation on instruments in the 17th century. This approach makes it possible to trust the technological evolution in which PZTs are placed. Then we will see the context in which l'Observatoire de Neuchâtel chose to equip itself with a PZT in the mid 20th century. For this purpose, we will have an overview of the discussion surrounding its setting up, its role on the more global project in which it was commissioned. Finally, we will try to understand why its use was relatively short in view of the substantial investment it represents for the institution by presenting the paradigmatic break caused by the introduction of atomic time. As early as the 17th century, tests were carried out to determine the parallax of stars to confirm Copernicus heliocentric theory. Several astronomers have sought to measure the parallax of a star as Galileo. In 1669, Robert Hooke, the great 17th century English experimenter, discovered that the effects of atmospheric refraction were zero at the zenith and that the star Gamma Draconis was almost at the zenith in London. But he didn't have a telescope specifically designed for this purpose and the instrument used was damaged. Taking over, John Flamsted, the first royal astronomer had built a Zenith telescope. Then Samuel Molineux and James Bradley devised other Zenith instruments to measure the parallax of Gamma Draconis. Finally, John Pond made several attempts to have an efficient instrument in the first half of the 19th century, but he did not succeed in obtaining really satisfactory results. 
In the mid-19th century, George Airy managed to take a step forward with, the, with his reflex zenith tube that you see here on the left. He had the RZT made in 1851 by the scientific instrument maker Sutton and Sims. The instrument was used for almost a century to observe gamma draconis, even if unexplained error led to the suspension of the program at the end of the 19th century. The movements of oscillation of the Earth's axis, the Chandler wobble, were not precise, precisely known. At the beginning of the 20th century, the theory is better understood on the airy observation are recalcul recalculated, demonstrating the instrument's very high accuracy on the program was relaunched. The development of Zenit observation take a new direction at the beginning of the 20th century in Gaithersburg, Maryland. In 1911, Frank Ross designed the first PZT, which was placed later at the Washington Naval Observatory to make observation of latitude variation. This instrument was an improvement of the RZT with a notable addition of photography. It is thus from 1911 that it becomes a PZT. The instrument is here connected to a sidereal clock on a printing chronograph. Observations, various tests on improvements show that PZT can be used for time determination. The theory of observation for time determination began in 1924. In 1949, a second, more advanced PZT was designed by, by William Markowitz known for his work on time standardization on the atomic clocks, and by Paul Sullenberger, who worked on quartz clock and developed PZTs. At the same time, the result of the observation made with the PZT of Washington were presented to the International Astronomical Union in Copenhagen. One of the recommendations of the union advised observatory around the world to be equipped with this type of instrument. To maintain their reputation in the field of time determination, a race begins between different observatories in which l'Observatoire de Neuchâtel participates. Here you can see some examples of PZT of, PZT of other observatories. Edmond Guillot, the third director of the l'Observatoire de Neuchâtel, who is taking part in this Congress of Copenhagen is keenly interested in PZT and will do his best to obtain one of them. Now, let us look at the Observatoire de Neuchâtel and see how it fits into this story. Let us begin with a few words about its foundation. In 1855, coming back from the Exposition Universelle de Paris, a delegation want to increase the quality of clocks and watch production in the canton of Neuchâtel. In its report, it asked the state to establish an observatory dedicated to the control and certification of chronometers. The task of designing and then directing the institution is given to Adolf Hirsch, a young German astronomer. The Observatory de Neuchâtel is founded in 1858 on a small hill outside the city. Its main missions were the astronomical determination of time in order to certify watchmaking production and to transmit time to the central telegraph office, to watchmaking paces, and to some watchmakers. During the 19th century and the first half of the 20th century, the meridian circle was the essential instrument for time determination. We can see here two generations of instrument in use in Neuchâtel. A meridian circle is not geometrically perfect. Any observation is filled with errors that should be known and checked, such as inclination, collimation, and azimuth. The observer also became a significant source of error since the introduction of the printing chronograph in the mid 19th century. The delay between the moment the observer sees the bisection of a star with a wire and the moment his finger closes on electrical contact is not quantifiable. This delay, called personal equation, is studied by Adolf Hirsch, who will be one of the precursors to measure and reduce it. At the price of incessant check and long mathematical reduction, 
the astronomer managed to master his instrument, his environment, and his own physiological imperfection. The Observatoire de Neuchâtel does not have the financial or human means to follow every technical improvement. When it updates its operating chain, it cannot afford to choose the wrong technology at the risk of being totally inoperative. In the 1940s, profound changes appeared on the horizon with the emergence of quartz clocks. The Observatoire de Neuchâtel decided that is the right momentum to update its in instrumentation and methods in a profound way. The centerpieces of this new era will be the PZT and the quartz clock. Coming back from Copenhagen, Edmond Guyot was convinced of the importance of getting a PZT. He became very active and negoci negotiation began with Washington in order to benefit from the technology and experience. Since this was a military technology, diplomacy became involved. After difficulties in obtaining technical drawings or a direct offer from Washington, Rio starts looking for other manufacturers. As with Greenwich and later the observatory on Mount Stromlo in Australia, Neuchâtel turns to the, to the English company Group and Persons. Greenwich was already developing a PZT with Group and Persons, simply called the Model 1. But by the manufacturers himself, the Greenwich model is excessively complex. Groben Person proposed a lighter and cheaper model called number two. Finally, Neuchâtel chose an in-between model called the 1A, which will be ordered in 1951. It is delivered three years later for a price of 16,000 pounds. About half of the cost is covered by the watchmakers, demonstrating that the industry still need a cutting edge observatory. It was not until 1959 that the PZT definitively replaced the Observatory Meridian Circle. With this technology, the expected accuracy for time determination, de determination is around one thousandth of a second. The general principle is the same as the Washington PZT. The light of the star is reflected by a mercury bath before reaching a photosensitive plate. The star is photographed twice before the zenith transit and twice after it. Each exposure lasts 20 seconds during which the plate is driven to follow the motion of the star. Between each exposure, the plate rotates by 180 degrees. Each star is then photographed four times forming a rectangle on the photographic plate. On this slide, we have a diagram showing the main organs of the PZT of Neuchâtel. On the left, the phonic motor, the control cams, the rotary and the stellar photographic plate to record the transit of the star like we just seen. Since it is a question of determining time and keeping it, it is necessary to compare the transit with the working state of a fundamental clock, the quartz clock. This is the role of the photographic chronograph, represented here in light green. The chronograph is controlled by a reduced frequency of the quartz clock and then synchronizes to trigger a flash lamp every two seconds. The flash is then filtered by a perforated plate to form a single instantaneous point on the photographic time plate. The transit of the star being known by the catalogues it is then possible to determine the advance or the delay of the quartz clock by measuring and comparing the two photographic plates. The vertical construction of the PZT eliminates the main instrument error present on the meridian circle, such as collimation, azimuth, and inclination. The PZT is installed in an unheated and insulated building to prevent errors due to sudden temperature changes between the instrument and its environment. The PZT also has the great advantage of eliminating the human factor in the acquisition. The device is programmed in order to automatize the acquisition cycle. However, a person still has to initiate the cycle manually. 
The PZT requires more maintenance than the meridian circle to do the greater number of mechanical and electrical components. It is therefore an important cost for a small observatory like Neuchâtel. The PZT was used until 1982 at the Observatoire de Neuchâtel at the request of the Mizuzawa Observatory, which wished to continue the series of observation of latitude variations. Time determinations were no longer made at the Observatoire de Neuchâtel from the end of the 70s. Whereas meridian circles were used at the observatory for one century, the PZT remains in use for about 20 years. Why this relatively rapid loss of interest? The high precision of the quartz clock confirmed that the reg regulator used, the Earth's radiation, is not perfectly uniform. New correction must be added to the time determinations to check quartz clock. As the Earth's regulator was imperfect, on the precision of the means of keeping time much greater, a redefinition of the second, based on the oscillation of cesium, took place in 1967. During these years, l'Observatoire de Neuchâtel, in collaboration with other research institutes such as Ebochessa on Osseo Quartz, put a lot of energy into developing quartz and then atomic clocks. The observatory gradually transformed itse itself into a research laboratory rather than an astronomical observatory. The use of atomic time made the time determination outdated compared to the time conservation using, using atomic clocks. Thus, the last step obtained in time determination instruments at the cost of a considerable effort is supplanted by the paradigm shift in time measurement. Moreover, many observatories that had planned to acquire a PZT abandoned their project during the year 50s, 60s. At the end of the 60s, fewer than 20 observatories had PZTs. Nevertheless, PZT has enabled several observatories to operate in a network movement, which has now been consistently extended. PZTs participate too in the improvement of time metrology. But the scientific instruments, contrary to initial expectations, also contain sources of error that have reduced its potential. Here you see two time squares that show the dates of conceptualization of methods or instruments and their dates of use. Meridian circles and Zenith instruments found their foundation in the 20th century and were developed long afterwards. PZTs took over from meridian circle for a short period before being replaced by atomic clocks. PZT are also a culmination of the desire to eliminate the human factor from time determination. The human factor then changes its stat status from observer to operator. The main objective was also always the same, improving the accuracy of data. There is still relatively little historical work on PZTs. This presentation was an opportunity for us to delve into the, the history of this scientific instrument, which we, went, which we intend to study in more details with contact with other institutions in view of a future publication. We would also be happy to answer any question you may have and thank you a lot for your attention. Thanks a lot to, to both speakers. It was very well organized. Uh, I would ask the audience if there are uh, questions. And I think Paolo Brenni has one. Maybe you can type your question uh, in the chat and they will reply and you can have uh, the conversation. In the meantime, uh, while Paolo writes... Uh, may, I, may I... Yeah, sure. Sorry, Roberto, may I... Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, sure. 
uh, thank you for your very interesting uh, uh, talk on this very specific uh, instrument in astronomy. I was wondering, I, I, make, uh, I make a question, uh, I mean a comment more than a question. Um, I was wondering, on, of course the measurement of time is uh, something that is essential in experiments in general and physics, but uh, and it is uh, very important in astronomy and astrophysics, uh, of course. And this type of measurement have, um, has changed uh, due to the uh, to many factors, of course, in the course of the uh, 20th century, uh, and not only uh, because the technologies have changed, and uh, as you have said, the clock, uh, the, the atomic clocks have been introduced. Uh, but also the, um, uh, the, 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 the accuracy required for some kind of, uh, of uh, measurements in astrophysics have uh, changed and so have driven towards uh, the use of uh, other uh, kind of um, uh, time measure, uh, measurements. And it would be interesting to extend uh, your research to uh, in some uh, and look to uh, the development of these techniques in function also of the different kind of astronomies in the 20th century probably uh, I, I think this could be this could be also an interesting uh, topic yes thank you for your comment we we think you're totally right and it's one of our goal to extend our research. Uh, it's a bit difficult on this time to to make a trip on other uh, way to 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 extend our research. But we we are planning to do that uh, this year, hopefully, or perhaps next year. Thanks a lot. Yes, it's very difficult time to do original research <laughs> around the different places. So <laughs> respect to one. Well, one lives it's for historians it has been a tragedy and for us as well so there is a question by paolo brenni but wasn't the zenith telescope uh, um, old-fashioned when it was installed in neuchatel did it come a little bit too late this is the question by paolo yeah thank you paolo for your question um it's Perhaps it's a bit too late, but in 1946, the International Astronomical Union uh, advised all the observatory to, to equip observatories with a PZT. So it was perhaps too late, but it was um, the, the, the fashion of this time. Uh, we, we can say, we can argue that to make the transition between meridian circle and atomic clocks, it was very important for the observatory of Neuchâtel to have uh, this kind of development because he, he has to, 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 to be more accurate with his technology. So yes, it's surely a bit too late, but it was a, perhaps a necessary step to, um, to manage the transition with atomic clocks. It's one of uh, the next uh, step of our research to, to, to analyze the instrument to understand if it was too late, if it was a, a failure or a necessary step. Thanks a lot. That is very interesting. And I'm also wondering, I mean, do you know about the process of decision of the International Astronomical Union, which made this uh, suggestion at the time? Uh, th th this was the question. If you have uh, also studied the this decision-making process within the International Astronomical Union. What were the rationale for this uh, suggestion? Yeah, in fact, uh, the, the Naval Observatory of Washington uh, presents the result of his observation of uh, 30 years of uh, research on the obs of uh, observations. And it was a commission, I don't remember the name, perhaps it's 17, who say it was a very uh, a good idea to develop and extend this kind of uh, instrument. But to, to be honest, uh, we don't really exactly know uh, the, um, the, the way they analyze the, the study by the Observatory of uh, Washington. So it could be an, another interesting uh, direction of our study. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, thank you very much. I think that 